Let's see.
in spite of the sadness, we still want to say thank you. As we move forward, God, to get through this afternoon's program, we pray for your blessings. We pray for your covering. We pray, God, that you will stay with us. And, oh, God, we look to you in every possible way, for we know our Redeemer lives. Bless and keep this service this evening. We look to you and we say thank you. In the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Divine Holy Spirit, and our hearts all say amen, amen. and amen. Praise God. At this time, we'll open up with a reading. And I'll be reading from the Old Testament, Psalms 121, verses 1 to 8. And it reads us thus. I will lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He will watch. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade. You're at your right hand. The, Lord, the sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over you. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in, both now and forevermore. Let's all say amen. At this time, the obituary will be read. Keith Henderson Griffith was born December 10th, 1949, in Barbados, West Indies, to the late Rufus Rice and Myrtle Griffith. He received his early education in Barbados. He worked at the Mobile Oil Company for many years, reaching the post of refinery foreman, the youngest in the company's history at the age of 19 before migrating to the United States in 1977. His education continued upon his migration to New York, where he attended printing trade school and received his diploma in printing services after working at several printing companies. Lastly was Enquire Printing and Publishing, where he worked for 12 years until the business closed and he retired. Keith was a member of Brooklyn Kings County Lions Club for many years. He was the recipient of many awards, including the Robert J. Uplinger Service Award, Lion of the Year, and the Alexander T. Wells Distinguished Service Award. He is, sur he is survived by his beloved wife, Morel, of more than 30 years, his son, Christopher, sister Eleanor in Barbados, along with a host of nieces, nephews, and cousins, neighbors, and friends. I would also like to extend a special thank you to our cousin Anne and our cousin Ian. Um, Anne was there for us in many ways, and we could not have had the strength to get through this. And she was with my mom and when I couldn't be there and they drove to the hospital every day and they spent many hours going back and forth and doing everything that they could for dad and for Ian who well, this service, this service and the service in Barbados would not have been possible without. He did an amazing job in the pre preparation of the body and without him, none of this could happen. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Listen to the many years on the jobs. Long time, right? He really, really have a legacy behind. At this time, we're going to go into a song. The king of love, my shepherd is. Sing 
along? The first one. song. At this time, we're going to go into two more readings, Revelations 21, 1 through 7, which will be read by Heisen and Gora, and John 14, 1 to 6 by Ted. You can come. reading is from Revelations 21 verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for those words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. The word of the Lord. The scripture that I'll be reading is John 14, 1 through 6. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That you, will, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. to another hymn, Amazing Grace, and it's also in your program, Amazing Grace.
praise God. At this wonderful time, we are going to hear some testimonies. I know many of you know, knew him. Many of you maybe have spent time with him. And we want to hear from you. This is one of the things that the family look forward to hearing because this is what keeps them. A lot of things maybe you know that they don't know about our wonderful beloved. So by you sharing a little bit about him does bring lots of joy within the hearts to our bereaved families. So we want to hear from you. We want to get some maybe laughters, some things that he maybe had said to you, things that you have remembered. So I'm going to ask you, for those of you who are going to say something, to come on down. Come on down. Do I have to start pointing or you just know who you are? I think I can recall some names, right? So we're going to ask you to come on down. Come and share. Come and share. I want to hear some things about him. I don't know him. So I want to hear about him, right? And the family will appreciate that as well. Come on down, my dear. You don't have to come behind the podium if that's what you're afraid of. You can stand right here if you want to, okay? But we want to hear some great testimonies. I never gave a testimony before. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I knew Chris Griffith through his son. Uh, we were in remedial. He would always call me his, uh, his other son. Uh, that was always something that I, I looked forward to whenever I went to visit the family. No matter how long it's been, he would always call me his other son. And um, I remember the Thanksgivings that uh, he made sure there was a table, a spot at the table, a plate for me. He'd always tell me to eat more. Like, you know, you look like you're... you're slimming down too much, you know, you're losing too much weight. So he always made sure to look out for me in his own way. Um, and my sister. Uh, he's always the person that, that put his heart on his shoulder. Um, did so much for me. Gave me so much advice. Chewed my ear off so many times with stories <laughs> about whether it was him, him working at the paper company or anything. And I'll be honest, I tuned like 25% of it out. <laughs> but it's that lingering 75% that I remember right now. And um, i give anything just to hear another one. Hi everyone. Um, I knew Keith through my dad. My dad and him was best friends. One of the things I remember about him is the stories they used to tell about going to fats and um, eating enough lamb stew. And <laughs> um, when I was going to school, so I lived in Philadelphia at the time, but I would come to New York to go to school. Many nights he would talk me the whole way home, driving home. And I appreciated that because many times I would fall asleep or start to fall asleep and he'll call and say, let's school yet, you know, and he'll tell me about stories. One thing about him is if he had a story, and I've heard the story a lot, <laughs> he doesn't want you to end or contribute. He wants to tell you the story, hold on, it's my story, though. <laughs> so um, I, I am going, I just... I can't believe I just knew. Yeah, it, this this is a tough one. 2023 is a tough one, but he was a friend to all, and if he could help you, he would help you. But he also was a very straight shooter. So that that is a, a quality that's lacking these days. So I personally will definitely miss that. Thank you. Straight shooter. Hi, my name is Keisha. It's kind of funny when I ask about how I know Keith, I can't actually say how, because I still have known him my entire life, and I probably have, I just don't, I can't tell you like, I met him when I was five or I met him when I was 10, I just know the name was always in our household. And I feel I know, I probably saw more of Chris when I was younger, and then when I was older, I saw more of Keith. But what I want to share with you is that when it came to Keith, 
The things he always talked about was one, Barbados. Every political story he could give you the, it started with this person and then their family knew this person and he could go on and on and on and bring it into the future and the, he had always had the good story when it comes to the Barbados history and all that kind of stuff and he was very proud. Even me who was in Barbados at the time, whenever I come up, he would just always be like, so what's going on? He knew more about what was going on in Barbados than people who lived there. <laughs> the other thing that I feel that was most important to Keith was his family. If it wasn't talking about Chris, it was talking about Morel. His favorite story, he told it to me almost every single time he saw me, was a story about Chris and the house. Apparently, when he, Chris was younger, someone came and said, oh, I want to buy the house. And Keith told them, you can buy the house if Chris says he will sell the house. And Chris said, I'm not selling the house. My father said this house is for me. <laughs> Every single time he would tell that story. And even when they were like arguing, because he liked to argue, he would always end up Everything I'm doing is to make sure that my family, my wife, and my son are always taken care of. And I felt that whenever I talked to him, I knew what a good man he was, a good family man, and that kind of person will always be appreciated. And I want you to know, even if people don't say it, that they do appreciate what he said, on what he did because he was a good example of what it meant to be a good Barbadian, a good man, a good family person. And I feel that the, you need more people like him. Thank you. Don't hold back. Make sure you come up. We have some time. Hi. Um. I know Keith from Barbados, from, he was actually my dad's friend, and actually when I came up here, we stayed in touch with each other, and he used to work at mobile, and even when I hear people say, like, he went to do printing. The same day he was going to do printing, I was working at a pharmacy, and he said, come and go with me, we could apply for the job together. Actually, I drove to Long Island, and the money they were paying, I didn't really want to, I didn't want to keep the feel bad, but I said, look, you know what? I just applied to the airline, and I, they were paying more. But actually, I was just going to drive, like, some days to the printing place, and then he would drive, like, the other time to the printing place. And I felt kind of bad because I pull out, and he went to do printing, and I went to work with the airline and stuff. So it's like even, I mean, there's so many stories with me and Keith. When he, when he used to live on, with his aunt on, um, Larry Moore, he called me, and I was at the pharmacy doing prescriptions at the time, and my boss didn't want to give me the day off. I tell him, well, listen, you can keep the job because I got to move Keith, and I went to get a U-Haul truck, and I took all this stuff, and we moved to, like, uh, Lennox. I can't remember. The number was, like, 310 or something like that? It's 310? Okay, see? Okay, that was way, way back, man. And, like, listen, we had so much good times together. Even though there's some nights we wouldn't see each other, I would just call him on the phone, and actually about a month ago I was here for a week, and I walked right over at Keith Hall. I left my car parked right here, and I just walked to see if he was home. And, you know, so many stories with him, but it's all, all good stories, you know. And I'm um, Chris, uh, God, Dad, and I remember days when Chris was a little child. He would bring me, and I would cut Chris here, and he's here, and we always have fun together, man, you know. So I really miss him. He's really a true friend, you know. And I could call him anytime, and he could call me anytime for anything, you know. And there's very few people that I could say is really stand up and really is, is like that. And there's so many false people in the world. You know, he was always a straight, straight guy, always with me, actually, you know. I don't know if there's a problem or anything. Although I'm busy, I would just come and talk to him about anything. So I know so much about the family, and, you know, his family is like my family. No, may he rest in peace. I love you, man. Hi, I'm Amanda. I am friends with Chris and Ted. 
um, who gave a wonderful reading earlier. Um, Ted and I went to the same college, and we lived not too far from each other. So Ted would uh, introduce me to Chris, and I would go to their houses. Um, we'd be back and forth and around the neighborhood. Um, and I got to meet Chris's family. Um, and I, um, quite a few times I've been over. Um, they've welcomed me into their home. I have been in the car with Keith. Um, so I, it, it is talking the whole way. Um, and I've tried very hard to keep up, but I often could not. Um, but one of those most valuable experiences that I've had um, was when Ted was going through a really hard time, him and his sister, and we all went to Chris's house, and Keith gave um, some really powerful advice, and he helped out the situation, and something I'll never forget is how he held himself accountable. Um, I come from a family who doesn't, who's not very good with that, um, kind of a sweep things under the the rug. White people are very good at, at, like, at doing it. It's a very white people thing. Um, so to have parents who actually said, yeah, I did some messed up stuff, um, and I had to own up to that. That's something I've never heard from a parent before. And to hear Keith say that um, really, really left a, an impression on me, and I will never forget that. And I will always value, no matter what went down, I will always value that, just pure honesty, like blunt honesty. Like, yeah, we're going to, we mess up and we, we own up to it. So he will be missed. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Earl Sadahu. I received an email earlier today. I was asked by the president of the Canarsie Lions Association to represent Canarsie Lions Group at the funeral service this evening. And the cooperating member that I am at short notice, I decided to come. I walked into this funeral parlor. I was not even sure of which one of the funerals I was attending because I barely scanned over the email to see the name. But I remember the name Griffith. And I'm sitting there and my, my partner handed me this program and I looked at it. I realized I worked with Chris for 12 years at Enquire Printing and Publishing Company. I was his manager for the last six years before the company closed. If you read the program, you will see. I don't know if this is coincidence or is it divine appointment. But the born again Christian that I am, I think it is divine appointment. It's not, a, it's not a fortunate instance to be here to celebrate this moment. My condolences to the family and the friends who are here this evening. But the, my remembrance of, of Keith is that he was a very cooperative worker. He, he was strong as an ox. This guy, you, anything you ask him to do, he'll be willing to do it. Never a murmur from, from Keith. At first, when I met him, I asked him if he was related to Charlie Griffiths, because we all associate Griffiths with the West Indian uh, first, um, pace bowler. Not pace bowler, bouncer. <laughs> and he said, all Griffiths are related. <laughs> and in my work, I'm a, I'm a real estate associate broker, and I'm also a mortgage loan originator. I meet so many Griffiths, and if you ask them, as long as they're from Barbados, they're family. So it's a wonderful family. It was a pleasure knowing him, and it's unfortunate that it is at this occasion I come to meet the rest of the family, but my sincere condolences are with you, and may God, may his soul rest in eternal peace, and may God grant you the grace and sustain you as you go forward in this life. Thank you very much. My name is Rosanna Brathwaite, and I'm the president of Brooklyn Kings County Lions Club. Condolences to the family. For Keith, 
Being in the club, Keith considered himself the troublemaker. <laughs> as soon as Keith walked through the door, Keith would say, here I am. And I was the tail twister at that time. And he would say, Madam Tail Twister, just give me the fines. Because you know, all I'm here for is to pay my fines. And paying my fines, that means that the club is going to get some money. So even if I charge Keith $5, he would say, only 5 I'll give you 20 So Keith was really fun at our meetings. And he was really missed when he was out sick. And again, condolences to the family. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, I am Keith's neighbor. I've been with Keith since I was 14. And since I was 14, I've heard every Barbadian stories. <laughs> every story. He would stop me from school. Once he see me, hey, 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 come down. Either I would go up I would, or he would come down and he would tell me all his amazing stories, how he grew up. I'm still trying to give away my kids, but <laughs> to him and Chris, but that still didn't work for me. They told me no. But he is such amazing, wonderful man, and he is going to be truly missed because it's very weird me turning the corner and I'm like looking and I don't see him anymore. It's going to be really sad because I'm going to miss his stories. And even though you hear it before, I never would tell him, oh, I heard this story already. No, I let him speak because you know what? He was a very passionate, like passionate about his country. He loved Barbados, and he was like, you have to visit. And if you're going to visit, let me know, because you're going to visit my town. And I was like, okay, no problem. And I didn't get to visit. And I, I'm, I'm truly, truly going to wish and miss this man, because he was a second father to me. And he was wonderful. He was wonderful to me, my children. He did, you know, garbage days. If my mother wasn't around, he shoveled snow for us. He swept. Like, he was a true good neighbor, and I'm going to truly miss him. Hello, everyone. My name is Osman, and I... Um, I'm his second house to the south of, Chris, uh, of uh, Keith. And I, um, I remember I moved into the neighborhood 19, um, in 2004. And he was the first man to come in the block and, and, and like say, uh, welcome to the neighborhood. And he became like an older brother for me. If I'm looking for a plumber, I'm looking for um, um, uh, work on the driveway, anything. Keep this for us. And uh, like my neighbor said, he's very passionate. He makes sure that you pay attention to him. He grabs you from hand and is usually close to you. He want to make sure that you pay full attention to him. He get his eyes on your eyes all the time. Very passionate. Uh, very committed um, to his... Um, he loves politics. I love politics too. So we had a lot of things in common. So uh, we speak a lot about politics. I'm a teacher also, and he was uh, in the printing business. He told me a lot about the business. When you're thinking about, uh, maybe you got some time, some point, at some point to get together and get things going on, but life was short enough to the point that we didn't get to go and do what we have to do. Uh, Chris was a good man. Was a good husband and a good father and a good neighbor. Um, my condolences to Morel and Chris. When I came there, Chris was a little boy. And I remember him going to school and coming back. And, and I can always see him talking to Chris about the school, continuously about the school. And I, and I said, don't you agree? And I'm a, I'm a teacher. I have to agree. So he had, he, had, he had that passion. He had that personality that grabs you and, and keep you captivated about his stories. 
Very good man. We miss him a lot. May Allah, may God bless him. I bet bless you, uh, Morel and Chris and all the family and friends. We miss you a lot. Thank you. After this, one more. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, on behalf of the other side of the family, the Archers, um, grew up knowing Keith as my cousin. He was married to, well, you know, who he's married to, but his brother, which is, I call him uncle, because he's part of our family. So while I was here, his niece was texting me all the time. So she wanted me to say that she thanked him. Oh, I can't read my glasses on. So he said, um, he looked up, he said he was always there for her and he was always ready to take to assist her whenever she come to the US. He would always come by me because you know she stood by me. So he's always there. She said, he looked up to her father, saw him as a father figure. Well, there was nothing neither one thought was too much for the other. They both love each other unconditionally. That's he and his brother that she's talking about. He loved his nieces and whenever he come by me, yes, he always give me stories about Chris, he always tell me his wife, how he meet around, way back, how what y'all were to each other. He always had a smile. Like my sister said, those teeth when he smiled, white. And he had the biggest smile that you could even, you know, you have, if you're around Keith, you had to laugh. There's no way you could be around Keith and have a sad face. He was always there for everyone, and he would be greatly missed. Chris and Laurel, I love y'all. And y'all know I'm still here, and I'll always be here for y'all. Bye. Well. Thank you, Reverend. Good evening. My name is Milton Moe. I hailed um, from St. Vincent. I'm happy to tell you that I'm heading up the St. Vincent contingent. Everybody spoke wonderfully tonight about my brother Keith, uh, how he loved Barbados. Oh, I could attest to that. Yeah, and if you don't know, if those of you who have emailed him know what his email address starts with, Bridgetown. <laughs> I came to United States in 1969 and left a group of friends back in Kingstown, St. Vincent. When I was up here about less than a year, I got a call. And the rest of the boys, the other boys who were there said, about three of them were on the phone, and they said, we want you to know you have another brother. So what brother? And he's gone now, but the name for a lot of us is the body. He said, they said, the body is key. Okay, uh, about less than a year later, I think it had something to do with him coming to the United States or something. But however long it was, it was my responsibility to pick him up. Our friendship started there, and it has not ended. I traveled here from Canada, and I don't care if I had to walk, I was going to be here. I had my birthday is this weekend. I said to my wife, she said, well, they're planning a surprise birthday. I said, they can have hopefully they'll have many times to do that. But I think this will be the last time I get a chance to say goodbye to my friend. And I'm going. So my brother, go rest high on the mountain. Farewell. If you were Keith's friend, he would die for you. I was his friend. No, I was his brother. I came outside tonight and they said, what were you really, what, who are you to the deceased? I said, his brother. <laughs> let them tell me no, because they can't, because he wouldn't let them tell me no. His wife and his son. I love you all dearly and always will. And I'll always be here for you, like I'm here now. Thank you all. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. What great testimonies, what great memories. And I'm sure the family will, and their quiet moments will reflect. And everything, little by little, will come back to them to know what you have said about her husband and father. 
at this wonderful time, we're going to go into musical selection again. Blessed assurance. At this time, I want everyone to stand singing this song. Stretch your feet. Rejoice in this song. It's a beautiful song. Blessed assurance. Except for the family. Immediate family don't need to stand unless you want to. But everyone else, let's stand and sing this song to the glory of God. And the next voice you'll be hearing after this song is none other than his son, Christopher Griffith, will be coming before you. Blessed assurance.
Good evening. <clears throat> um, I've been trying to write this for about three weeks now, and I can't find the words. The only thing I can think of is an old African proverb that I can't get out of my head. And it says, the death of an older person is like the burning of a library. I think we've lost a great library. Many books, stories, tales that he can tell a thousand times the same way 20, 30 years after they happen. We all hear the stories over and over and over again, as everyone here has said. He will catch you and hold you and make you listen to the story. <laughs> There's many different versions of those stories, but it's pretty much the same. Uh, and I'd do anything to hear another one. We share many things, many likes, dislikes, almost share a birthday, off by one day. I was late. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and thank you. Um, we share many things, as a lot of people who know us will say, and um, a lot of our close family and friends will say, we're both stubborn. <laughs> so we're not stubborn, we are assertive about what we believe, it's not being stubborn. So I'll say I share that with dad, as I can't forget it, because everyone in this room tells me we're both stubborn. Um, and he was a person I, I thought would always be around. And honestly, I think a man who's so stubborn that death had to wait for him to be sedated to take him. <laughs> he didn't want to argue with him. As a person who's argued with him many times, I agree. Um, and I, I, I still can't find the words. I, I'd say I miss him, and it's not enough. And I keep thinking over and over about the last time I saw him. And he said, I was with Ted and mom. And he said, I love you, take care of the house. And that'll be my last memory of him in person. And he was a person who would tell you what he felt and what he thought, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> All the nods, yeah, I know it's true. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of sweeping under the rug. There's a lot of ignoring things, a lot of not talking about things. But one thing I can say is when dad was in the room, there was no elephant in the room. <laughs> we gonna speak, we gonna talk about it. And it's a quality that's very rare. And I wish I could see more of in people today. And everyone says that I've inherited it, that the, the Griffith family were all stubborn. If that's the worst thing I get, it's not bad. <laughs> um, I, I just, I, I just still, still can't find the words. He's the, the, probably the greatest formative figure in my life and 
I love him. I miss you. And have to get this off. Ever since he died, we picked the hymns for the song. And I have in the back of my head, Blessed Assurance. And we used to sing it every Sunday at church. And I forgot the words. I forgot so much of it. But the melody, I can't get out of my head. We flew down to Barbados. We had a service there. And we're on the way back. And I can't get this melody out of my head. And finally, finally I found one hymn, one line of the hymn. And I searched it and I found it. And as soon as I found it and decided, all right, I'll play it at the funeral. It stopped playing as much. I, I stopped thinking about it as much. And now that it has been sung, I don't think about it at all. Only you could be stubborn from beyond the grave. <laughs> I did it. We sang it. And I will always think of that song. Some of my earliest memories are in church, singing that song. And I'll just say you will be missed. I love you dearly. And no matter how hard we fought, how hard we argued, you always did what was best for me, what you thought was best for me, whether I liked it or not. So may you rest in peace, Dad. <laughs> sing how great thou art and I'm going to give a word of encouragement how great thou art
Praise God. I've done so many funerals and to tell you the truth this is the first one that I've had so many beautiful old heart songs my god beautiful beautiful just the hymns today a lot of folks are doing all the upbeat songs right all the the new versions that are out but it's nothing like when we go back into the olden days something about those songs does something to our hearts. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful hymn, beautiful hymns tonight. Each one was so beautiful. We can relate to them. So I thank God for this this afternoon. Again, great evening. For those who came in late, my name is Minister Don Baxter. I'm a chaplain and also a counselor here in New York. And more so, I'm very much involved in the community. I love to serve, so I'm constantly taking care of community work out in the field. So we thank God that we can gather here tonight. On behalf of the family, I welcome every one of you here gathered this evening to remember our beloved Keith Griffith. Praise God. Your presence here affirms your love and support for this family. Thank you for being here this evening. On behalf of the funeral home, Carib, and myself, we just want to say how much we care. We are so sorry for the loss of our beloved husband, father, friends. We are here to honor and remember Keith. During this time of grief, pain, and sorrow, we find comfort in sharing stories and remembering the life of our beloved. Think of this for a moment. As we plan for and prepare our weeks, and we plan every day, right? We are always planning, planning for work, planning to do so many things. We rarely plan for a funeral service. Do we, ever, do we ever get up thinking about a funeral service that we may have to plan for? A lot of times, no. We're just busy people, busy, knowing that we're going to live a long life, eating, doing all that we want to do, right? We never plan for a funeral service. My God, these are unexpected events that can happen during snow or slow times or busy seasons. The reality is that when our loved ones is gone, the family needs to hear a message of hope centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a sad yet important reminder of the shortness of life and an opportunity for hearts and minds to focus on Jesus Christ for comfort. It is so important to understand that we live our lives, we move around, we do everything, not thinking anything, sometimes not even about Jesus Christ. But in situations like this, when we gather, for some reason, our minds start to center around Christ and all that he has done. And tonight, I want to give you some words, from encouraging words from Psalms 23. 
one to four, and maybe I'll cut short. And here it goes. And it says here, I know the Psalms, but he knows the shepherd. This was a famous entertainer getting ready to share something with the audience. A famous entertainer was asked to recite the 23rd Psalms in a performance. A large audience filled the large auditorium. After he finished, everyone gave him a great round of applause. After this, the old or older adult was asked to present the same psalms. When he was finished, there was a no dry eye. There was nobody eyes that was dry in that place. His devotion to the shepherd touched everyone. The entertainer came back to continue the program. Before getting started, and starting the program again, he said, I know the Psalms, but he knows the shepherd. Amen. One recited it, got a round of applause, but the elder, the older one, when he was finished, everyone was crying. It's something about our seniors, it's something about men and women who have spent their lives studying and having the wisdom that when they speak, we listen, don't we? So it's important to understand that it's good to know the Psalms, but it's also better to know who? The shepherd. Psalms 23 is the most popular and probably the most read Psalms of all. It brings comfort and encouragement to all who read it. However, most people miss out on some of the deepest and wealthiest truth of this Psalms. Let's take a look at Psalms 1 to 2. The shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall fear no evil or want no evil to come upon us. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. David wrote this psalm from a personal experience because he too was a shepherd. David knew that he had received God's great care all his life. The shepherd fed David in peaceful green pastures. He refreshed him with cool water from a quenched streaming water stream that flowed. God's provision so well, God provided so well for him that he lacked nothing. And we all know what a shepherd does, right? He, sh he cares for his sheep, making sure that his sheep needed nothing. And that's what Christ was to David. David was satisfied, but all of this was because David knew the Lord. David called the Lord my shepherd. David knew his shepherd well, and the Lord knew David well. The story is about a wealthy London businessman who searched for many years for his runaway son. One afternoon, he was preparing to board a train to London when he spotted a man in rags, dirty clothing, begging for money from passengers along the station platform. His first impulse was to avoid the beggar. How many of us do that when we're on the train and going places? We see them coming and sometimes we are going right. There we go, right? We all do that, most of us. I too, sometimes you don't want to be bothered with them. We don't know in these day, last days what they're coming up with, what they have on them. So yes, wisdom will tell us, don't stop, keep going, right? But there was something strangely familiar about this young man. When the beggar approached and asked if the man could spare a few shillings, the businessman realized he had found his long lost son. Crying a few shillings, 
You are my son, the father said. Everything I have is yours. Unlike the businessman's son, David knew he belonged to the Lord. The good shepherd provided for all his needs. God's provision are available only if the Lord is your shepherd. How can the Lord become your shepherd this evening? It went on to talk about the re he restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Why do we need a shepherd to restore our soul? Here is it. Because it is the nature of a sheep to wander away from the safety of the foal. How, much, how many of us have used to observe the sheep when we are back in our Caribbean country? It's only the shepherd keeps them in straight line, right? <laughs> Other than that, they're all over the place. They wander away, right? So like the sheep, we have wandered into the wilderness of sin. According to 1 Peter 2 and 25, we are like sheep gone astray, but have not now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Only the shepherd can restore our souls from the rages of sin. Only the shepherd can restore us from sin. Only the shepherd can do that. Only he can make us right with God again. He gave, is for, he is given and forgiven God. He is a God that forgives. It doesn't matter what state you're in. The shepherd will always come to our rescue. It doesn't matter what we do, how we did it. Once our hearts are ready, Christ is ready to restore us back to him. This is the reason why Jesus came to the earth. How can a lost sheep be restored to the fold through repentance and faith? The word repent means we stop going our own way and return to the shepherd. As we like, the just like us, the sheep, we go astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord and the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of all of our sins. We ask Jesus to restore our soul. We must believe that he died for our sins and that he rose again and he lives. And where does he live right now is in our hearts. So this evening I'm here to encourage you. I cannot preach to daddy. I cannot preach to Keith. He's not hearing a thing coming from me. But I'm here to encourage you that in life, no matter what we do, we all are owned by the shepherd. The breath in which we breathe is not our own. It's a loaned breath. We don't know when, sometimes we don't know how. But I believe this evening is a time when we can examine our hearts to see where we stand with God. Because God loves us. He died for our sins. And this evening, we need to give our lives back to him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, Lord. Your rod and their staff, they comfort me. How can you have the assurance when you face death? By making this journey with the shepherd. He knows the way. If you're traveling through a mountain, passing through, you need guide, right? How many of us go in the woods and so forth and there's always someone guiding us because that person knows what? They know where every part of that mountain or areas are. When we go on tours, we just don't go wandering, do we? There's always a guide to guide us. Often, weather sometimes hinder us from finding our way. So it's important that someone who knows the way, who knows the jungle, who knows those areas, be with us to help us through. This is what the Good Shepherd has done for us. He is the one only to journey us, no matter what. When death comes, it's important to understand where we stand with God. So should he call or come, would we be ready this evening? The Good Shepherd is saying today, 
Turn your life around. Turn your life over to the Lord. He loves you. And as I close this afternoon, the end of the journey through life on earth is, is, is to be with God forever in his baptism. Jesus is the answer. There's no other way. It doesn't matter how much we do what we do. At some point, it's time that we turn back and understand that Jesus loves us. There is a heaven and there is a hell. There's a saying that says, broad is the way to lead to the, that leads to destruction. But narrow there is, is only a few enters in. We do know that in life, it's not, not promise. Life is not promise, brothers and sisters. But the promise is in Christ Jesus. So this evening, I encourage you to surrender unto the Lord. And he will make you right completely. And as I'm closing, grief is a unique journey for each of us. And as we're journeying through the Psalms today, we pray and hope that you are in right standing with the word of God. Someday our journey will lead us all to the holy mountain of God, where we all, where we all see the full glory of our Father. Losing a loved one is a trying time for all of us. Whether we had time to endure an illness or even to say goodbye, or even unexpected a tragic full news, we are never fully prepared for the rage of the emotions and the grief that we will surely experience. Whether you seek strength, comfort, hope, or need to hear a familiar yet timeless word of scripture. May God of all comfort keep you and uphold you in your journey continuously. May the love of Christ keep you and as he leads you through the still waters, he will comfort you. There is no particular time when one could say it's time to get over it. Never, never. We can mourn for many. There's always going to be that void. The reflection of that, the reflection of the great times, the reflection of the discipline will more than likely pop up. So we continue to grieve until we choose. It's time that I need to move forward. But it will never, never end. How many of us have lost a loved one and you still reflect? Tears still fall. I've lost my mom seven years ago and there are times I still started to talk. Especially, you know, they have this new thing on your app that you sync with Google and they send you these reminders of all these pictures years ago. And when I see her, sometimes I'll just like, you know, and your tear will come. I've lost a son. So the grieving still goes on, but we find comfort in the word of God. And if I heard earlier correctly, Keith mentioned that he go, when he goes to church, the songs may not always remember the word, but you'll hear the tune in your ears. And I'm sure all of us here today could testify in some way that you started your little life in Sunday school and you were brought up in Sunday school. Correct? So there is something in you that will cause you to always center your life around Christ and all that he has to offer you. So this evening I want to encourage you. I'm not going to say be strong because in your weakness there becomes strength. So it's important to know that when we lose someone, how can I really be strong? I may be strong to do the business in the preparation of a funeral, but deep down there's still weakness, but Christ that lives in the vessel gives you the strength to move on from day to day. So God bless you. I'd love to pray for someone. And as I close, I will go into prayer. And if you have a special request, you can just raise your hands and acknowledging that you need some prayer and I will go into prayer with for you. If no hands are raised, I will just do the closing prayer. And at, after we did, do the closing pray, prayer, I think Keith will come back and maybe give instructions for tomorrow. Is there a burial tomorrow? 
tomorrow, right? So he'll give you that time when, pe- when you have to return back. And we're going to get the coffin open, and you'll get your last viewing um, right after. So in the meantime, can someone just ask the, on the, the person up front to just come and open the coffin for us so we can start the viewing? Eternal and most righteous and everlasting God, we give you thanks. We honor you this afternoon. We thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together. We pray, God, that as this family continue to go through the grief and the mourn and the pain, we pray that you will continue to comfort them. Oh, Father, it's not easy, especially, oh, God, when a father is no longer in the picture anymore here on earth. But we know he's resting waiting to hear the trump of God's song when times will be no more. And Father God, when that time come, those who know you, those who were dead first, will be caught up to meet you. And those of us, if we remain here on earth, will also be caught up. But we thank you this evening for this family. We thank you for the friends, Father. And as we part from each other, don't let's part from you. Let us thank God of our lives and where we stand with you. We ask you to cover the family, Lord, as they prepare for tomorrow, as they rest tonight. Be with them. Comfort them. You're the only one God can give full comfort. Oh, Father, and help them to stick together in the unity and the love from you. Bless and cover. Bless the families as they leave tonight. Take them home safely. And those that are coming back, bring them back safely. And as they prepare to take the body, oh God, to put it back from when it came, we pray for the comforting spirit to lower over them as they, God, put the remains to rest. We look to you, God, and we say thank you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. We all say amen. At this time, we're going to take our last viewing. I don't know if tomorrow it will be open again. I don't know. You think so? It will be open tomorrow again, so those who are coming will be able to see get another viewing. So for those of you not maybe coming back, feel free, except the family, please feel free to come up. And I'm going to ask you that if you can, if you have to talk while we are viewing, please step outside um, if you have to. All right, so, all right, current plan, uh, we're going to meet back up here tomorrow at 9, and it's going to be a final viewing from 9 to 10, then we'll leave from here, we'll go to Canarsie Cemetery. And uh, then come back here and then go home. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to come from your left side because when you're turning around, you're turning around going to go home on your right side. So everyone should be on the left, on your right side, I'm sorry, on your right side. And when you're coming back, you'll be on your right side as well. Okay? So stay to my left, which is your right.